Alrighty. Well, welcome back to our class, Sacrifice of Christ in the Old New Testament. We are getting very close to the end now. Uh, tonight we'll be finishing up our look in the Gospels. Uh, we shall be looking at the Gospel of John tonight. Uh, primarily chapter 18 and 19, but first we're going to go chapter... Are we not on there? Oh, okay. <laughs> There we go. Let me restart it here. All right. I said we'll be looking at the Gospel of John as well as uh, two scriptures in First John. We'll be covering most of chapters 18 and 19, so we got a lot of ground to cover. But first, I'd like to go to chapter 1 of John. My brother Larry got on my first point Sunday, which was payback, I guess, for me getting on his sermon the week before. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. This seems to be a fitting scripture for considering Christ as our sacrifice. John 1, 29. It says, the, ne the next day John, that is John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So from, if I understand correctly, this was when Christ came to be baptized of John, when you compare with the other Gospels. But here he says, Behold the Lamb of God. This indicates that Christ was really the perfect sacrifice. He is, as Revelation 13.8 13, describes him, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Oh, and throughout the Old Testament sacrifices, we see a lamb as provision, and Christ was that lamb. He provided really all of the Old Testament sacrifices in one. So really, John said a mouthful here when he said, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, and it wasn't that Jesus' coming was plan B or plan C. You know, I've heard people teach that. Adam and Eve messed it up, so God had to come up with plan B, and that was the law, and then that didn't work out too well, so then Christ had to come. No, he was slain, as a, he was slain before the foundation of the world. That's what the Revelation says. He was or, as one slain from then. He was predestined and foreordained, if you will, as Brother Larry likes to say. He says, which taketh away the sin of the world. Here he he took away our sin. You know, the Old Testament sacrifices, they only covered them for a time. But Christ took away the sin forever. Yeah. You know, the uh there's a lot of debate on what the world is here in various other scriptures and I don't plan to get too much into that, but I can say if Christ took away the sins of every person on the face of this earth and all their sins will be taken away and they would be saved the world has a particular meaning which is not really in the scope of what I want to look at so let's go on to John chapter 18 we'll begin in verse number 3 John 18 3 says Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here we see the, the betrayal, the, the coming of the multitude, as it's called in the other Gospels, to arrest Christ. Verse 4 says, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and saith, or said unto them, Whom seek ye? Notice Jesus didn't need to know who they were seeking. He already knew. But I think he wanted to show them that he already knew. So John often portrays Christ as divine. And here he says, knowing all things that should come upon him. Christ was very much the omnipotent God in the flesh, wasn't he? he uh, Galatians describes him as, in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. 
I've said he's 100% God and 100% man, but we don't mean that that he was sinful man, but that he was 100% had a body like unto sinful flesh. Right. As we know in other scriptures, sometimes he got weary, sometimes he got tired, sometimes he hungered, and even thirsted, as we'll see later on. But he was completely God at the same time. He says, Whom seek ye? And they answered, verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, which obviously was him. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. This seems to kind of be the same type of I am that you know, Moses heard of God in the Old Testament. That, you know, I am was his name. But of course, obviously, he was testifying that he was Jesus. He was the Savior, the one that whom they sought. And it goes on to say, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Judas would stand with them, but he would later repent, quote unquote. Verse six says, as soon as then, or as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Amen. So here we see the power just of speaking the I am you know this one thing I like about John is he records details that others don't right. you know, this is not recorded in the other gospels the, just the power that Christ has when he speaks yeah. it can really, literally throw you on your backside mm-hmm. you know, I I imagine they kind of wonder what what happened here. Yeah. Just to think that Christ could have, I use that hypothetically, if he wanted to, just spoke and knocked them out of existence. Mm-hmm. Or as he's done in other places, spoke and the flame of fire come down and consume them, or the earth opened up and dropped them off. See, he had great power, but yet he submitted himself to the cross. As a uh, Hebrew said, he learned obedience. Uh, let's go on to verse seven, or excuse me, verse eight. It says Jesus answered, "I have told you that I am He. If therefore you seek Me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which He spake of them which Thou gavest Me. Have I lost none?" Now here He asked. For the disciples to be let go, that they wouldn't be arrested with him. I thought it was an interesting application, though, of the phrase of them which I, thou gavest me, have I lost none? Because, you know, physically he wouldn't lose them, and obviously spiritually he wouldn't lose them. Uh, this was his prayer in John seventeen twelve. If you want to read that sometime, that all that the Father had given him, he would lose none, save the son of perdition, which was Judas which obviously was foreordained to be the betrayer. Well, I also, when my study came, not that I believe the Apocrypha Scripture, but one of the Apocryphal books has the same quote in it. That That's a, I don't even know how you say it, Second Estras 2.26. I'm not advocating you to go study those up, but... did find it interesting that even that testified of the same thing. Verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servants, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. The other Gospels do not name Peter, but here John does, and even gives his servant's name. He tells us it was Peter that drew the sword, Probably before Christ could even give the answer in the other gospels to you know keep their swords up, and he's cut off his ear. You know, I wonder how Malchus was affected by this situation. You know, Luke tells us that Christ picked the ear up and put it back on, just like it was nothing. I know Malchus was not a saved 
man, definitely not at this point. Maybe the Lord saved him later. This is the only mention of him in scriptures. Right. I just can't imagine you would have this person cut off your ear and then this other fellow just stick it right back on. and right. Like, oh, that was nothing. He had the very least experienced the power of God firsthand. Perhaps it was to his condemnation, I don't know. Verse number 11 says, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And this cup refers back to his prayer in Gethsemane. Uh, as we saw last week in Luke 22:42, we, we asked if it was possible that the cup would be removed from him, but he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Well, Christ submitted himself to this cup, as he calls it here. The will that God has for him to suffer. To, and as we've shown in the last three Gospels, how he suffered greatly. Right. How he not only suffered physically, but emotionally, spiritually as well. Yeah. well shall I not drink it? He had to drink it. That the scriptures might be fulfilled, that the purpose and plan of God might be fulfilled. You know, it didn't matter if Peter had killed all those servants. He would servants. He would have still have went to do the will of the Father. Okay, let's go on to verse twelve. It says here the then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Here we see his arrest and led him away to Annas first for. He was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was a high priest that same year. So John adds that they first went to Annas' house, or at least to his wherever he was, before they went before Caiaphas. Verse 14 says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. But it seems that, I don't know if Annas and Caiaphas alternate the high priesthood but they're mentioned together as far back as Luke 3 and as far forward as Acts chapter 4 as being the high priest in Israel which is all the way from when John came on the scene baptizing until Peter and John were arrested verse 15 says and Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple that disciple was known unto the high priest and went in in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. As we saw in other gospels, Peter followed, but it, as it says, from afar off. Mm -hmm. He kept enough distance not to be too much associated, but close enough that he could still kind of keep an eye on things. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the way many Christians walk today, is right. well, as far off as they can. But this other disciple here, I believe is John, some People attribute it to Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. But John often refers to himself in this manner, though. And John also, in the rest of the scriptures we'll be looking at, gives us details that only could be known firsthand. Yeah. You know? I mean, certainly he could have learned them from someone else, but we find John, again, close to Jesus at the cross, so... Perhaps this was John here that went in. Uh, you could see firsthand the trial, if you will, of Christ. Uh, let's skip down to verse 19. The, the verses in between there, first part of Peter's denial. John breaks it up in two different parts. 19 says, The high priest then asked Jesus of, the, of his disciples and of his doctrine. So here they question him. Verse 20 says, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and the temple whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask me, or ask them which heard me, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I have said. Jesus basically says, I've told you all about me. Just ask those who have heard me. And he even says he did it openly to the world. He wasn't some secret Messiah or some secret Savior. But certainly he was only known to certain ones. Same today, those 
true, isn't it? That Jesus is open to the world, if you will. He's but much like the Jews, the majority of the world rejects him, doesn't see him as who he is. He just simply answers them, though, to ask those who have heard him. If he wasn't going to waste his time explaining again because they still wouldn't believe him. I think in another place it says that if I told you, you would not believe me. Right. Verse 22 says, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Here they smacked Jesus, if you will, on the head. I guess he thought it was kind of a sarcastic answer. Sometimes Christ answers come off that come off that way. I don't know if that's was his emotion behind it or not, but answers thou the high priest so he says. You know, they expected to give Christ to give reverence, if you will, to the high priest. Really, the high priest should have been in reverence to Christ. Exactly. Verse 23 says, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Really, this hitting of Christ was needless because he was without evil. He had done no wrong, and yet they falsely accused him. Right. If you remember from Matthew and Mark, they brought in false witnesses over and over and over again until they finally got two that would agree mm -hmm. because they couldn't find any actual fault with them. Verse 24 says, Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. So now he goes to Caiaphas, and we see more of the trial that we see in the other Gospels. Uh, verse 28. Here it says, Then led Jesus from Caiaphas under the or from Caiaphas under the hall judgment and it was early and they I skipped something I think that was Peter's denial there in between then led they Jesus from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment and it was early and they themselves went not in the judgment hall lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover Christ was killed at Passover he is described as our Passover lamb. He was really the fulfillment, if you will, of the Passover. But it's almost funny, for lack of a better word, that they wouldn't go in the judgment hall, that they wouldn't be defiled, yet here they are falsely accusing Christ. So that in itself defiled them. You know, it's said that the Jews thought it was wrong to enter the house of a Gentile, or at least that of a idolater, which certainly Pilate was. Yet they kill Christ and claim to be pure. Right. I think uh, Christ one time refers to him as that which is spiritually called Egypt, mm -hmm. a wicked place. Verse 29, though, we see Christ before Pilate. It says, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? But they answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would have delivered him up unto thee. You know, I had the thought of, they said something like Mr. Biden would say, you know, he did the thing. <laughs> they didn't really have a straight answer. You know, uh, he, he's, a, he's a male factor, that's why he brought him to you. <laughs> you figure it out. They really didn't have anything, any charges to, against him. Right. So they said, they tried to get Pilate to find something wrong with him. Verse 31 says, Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So Pilate basically said, Well, you take and deal with him. Pilate was often trying to take the easy way out. The Jews, I'm not, this saying of theirs, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. That obviously was not the Mosaic law because it very much allowed them to put people to death. Uh, at least 26 different capital offenses are found in the law. Right. This is why I said perhaps they're referring to Roman law here that 
under the Romans they were not allowed to do this or perhaps it was just they didn't want the Romans to do their dirty work for them but even more significantly verse 32 explains that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake signifying what death he should die you know, under Jewish law if he was truly a blasphemer they were to stone him to death and that was not the death that Christ was to die well, Christ was to be crucified as he says in multiple places John 3.14 says that as Moses lifted up serpent so must the son of man be lifted up right. and again in John 12 32-34 he repeats the same thought and plainly in Matthew 20 verse 18 and 19 he says the son of man must be crucified right. so, stoning was not the way he was to die right. I can't imagine it was a very painless death stoning but yet crucifixion was even more so exactly. let's go on here to verse 33 it says then Pilate entered into the kingdom hall again and called Jesus Pilate was going in talk to Jesus and going out and talking to the Jews because they you know, they were too quote unquote holy to go in then Pilate enter, entered into the judgment hall again and said, Je said or excuse me mixed up here and called Jesus and said unto him art thou the king of the Jews and he asked him plainly if he is indeed the king of the Jews and Jesus answers him in verse 34 Jesus answered him sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it of thee you know, ask him where did you get this idea that I'm king of the Jews so that was he truly was king of the Jews but not in the way that the Jews saw him and certainly not in the way that Pilate would have saw him, unless someone had, or excuse me, unless God had revealed it unto him. I don't think Pilate understood the scriptures enough to understand that Christ was the King of the Jews. Verse thirty-five says, Pilate answered, "Am I a Jew?" He said, well, "I don't know. I'm not a Jew. Thine own nation and the chief priests had delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done?" Well, he's giving Christ a time to confess here even though Christ had nothing to confess of verse 36 says Jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews but now is my kingdom not from hence this seems to be a very fitting scripture for election night here in the US right. as much as we would like to it America is not Christ's kingdom as much as we would like to see America be great for the rest of time it doesn't matter if Biden wins or a socialist is in control or we are conquered by a foreign nation yet Christ's kingdom will still rule and reign God will still be on the throne and he will still be in control of all things you know, th this world and this country is not our kingdom Certainly we live in it, and I think we have a duty to vote and to try to get the best person in there, but yet it doesn't matter if the wicked rule or the righteous reign, yet God is in control. Amen. I imagine if Christ, if this, this coming was to set up his kingdom on earth, it would probably be much like Revelation 19, where he swoops down and just with the word of his mouth he kills all his enemies and we saw just in his speaking I am that it knocked down those that came to arrest him no doubt he wouldn't have constrained Peter and the others would have joined as well to fight but yet that was not the purpose and plan of Christ at this time and one day he will come down and destroy all his enemies and rule with a rod of iron I believe yeah. that's where I differ with the all millennials that he's ruling now with a rod of iron exactly. not that he isn't on the throne not that he isn't in control but one day he will sit upon the throne here David's throne mm -hmm. verse 37 says Pilate therefore said unto him art thou a king then Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. 
For this end was I born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You know, Pilate asks kind of what seems should be an obvious question here. Art thou a king then? Well, Christ said he has a kingdom. He has to be a king. You know, uh, Caesar was a king in this day. It was his kingdom. Uh, Napoleon was it was his kingdom in France. Uh, King Genghis Kong it was his kingdom over there in China and Mongolia. And Christ is the king of his kingdom. It just wasn't the type of kingdom the Jews were looking for. <laughs> Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. And he basically as he often says, You said it or you betcha, that's me. To this end was I born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. What did uh, John one seventeen say? Grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. And John 14.6, Christ himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus came to bring truth into the world, bear witness of it, as he says here. Everyone that heareth my voice, everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. If you notice, not not everyone hears his voice, but everyone that's of truth. You're right. I'm reminded of John 10, 27, where he says, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Right. Not the goats of this world, but his sheep. Yeah. That's why the masses do not follow him, because they don't hear him. Amen. Spiritually, they can't hear him. Well, spiritually, we didn't hear him until he opened our ears. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's go on to the next verse here. Uh, Pilate asks, really a kind of profound question. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Man throughout it, history is trying to figure out what is truth. Well, the, there's over 224 different verses referencing truth in the scriptures. You know, there's a saying today which I detest. It's you know, my truth. There's no your truth, or and right. I don't have a truth. And Brother Kenny has a truth. There's only the truth. Right. Amen. But uh, the Word of God says, or really Christ in Himself in John seventeen seventeen says, "Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth." Amen. You know, the Scriptures, Word of God, the Bible, whichever term you want to use, that is the truth. You know, it, it's higher authority than any writings of man, any scientific discoveries of man. It is the absolute truth. And yet, so many reject it today because they don't like what it has to say. Verse 39, or ver end of verse 38 says that he, speaking of Pilate, went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault, or I find in him no fault at all. Well, Pilate, as before, he says he doesn't find any fault in Jesus. And that's because there was no fault in him. He was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Amen. Verse 39 says, But ye have a custom, Pilate is still speaking here, that I shall release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the King of the Jews? You know, he again tries to Get them to take Jesus back, if you will. Make his job easier. I can just get rid of a prisoner here and get rid of Christ all the same. Perhaps that would have soothed his conscience. But verse 40, notice the cry of the Jews. It says, Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. You know, it appears to not even been the first time that they had cried this. Because it says they cry, they cried all again, saying, "Not this man." Here is the preference for Barabbas, who is called here a robber. Now Barabbas was a robber. In the other Gospels, he's referred to as a murderer and an insurrectionist. So, best I can tell, he was rioting and in the process stealing and killed at least one person. Much like uh, the rioting that go that's going on in our country, 
like I mentioned before, Bravis would have been a model Democrat today. But they desired this wicked man over the very Savior, the very God, if you will. But so is the natural man. They were. They would rather have wickedness than God. They would rather have Satan himself than God himself. Right. Continuing on to verse or verse 1 of chapter 19, it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. That is, he beat him, he flogged him. You know, it's often said that his whip contained little pieces of bones on the end so that it would rip the flesh from the victim. No matter what it was, I can't imagine it felt good. So flogging is still allowed in certain countries even today uh, under Sharia law. It actually was, from my research, was even legal up in Australia up until the 50s. But no matter what he used here, he had beat him unnecessarily, but yet... We see over and over again Christ is beat that the scriptures might be fulfilled. It goes on in verse 2 to say, And the soldiers played a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him or put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Here they put the the crown of thorns and the robe on him and mocked him. You know, port portrayed him as a king and then mocked his kingship. When they beat him once more, they smote him with their hands. I think in one of the other Gospels it says they hit him on the head with the little makeshift scepter they gave him. You know, I don't care for being poked and stabbed and everything else, but I can't imagine those thorns being jammed down into your temple. and your No doubt it marred his visage, as Brother Larry pointed out, that it... The blood, no doubt, oozed down upon him, along with the scourgings that he had just endured. And probably, from a humanistic standpoint, looked very pitiful. Yeah. I think that's what Pilate plays on in the next verse here, verse 4. It says, Pilate therefore went forth and saith unto them, Behold, I bring, forth, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So Pilate again says he finds no fault in him. Verse 5 says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. You know, here's the problem with Pilate. He only saw him as a man. Behold the man. Not behold the Christ. Not behold the Savior. Not behold the God-man, but behold just the man. I think it was somewhat of a, I guess, a plea, if you will, to for the for compassion that they might look upon him and see that he had beat him, that he was well punished, if you will, and that that the Jews might release him. But that was not the purpose of God, and it certainly wasn't the purpose of the Jews here. They had sought for a long time to put him to death. Verse six says. When the chief priest, therefore, and officer saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. So they cried out once again, Crucify him, crucify him, as a, as a mob chanting. If, you know, mob rule, as I pointed out before, is what prevailed. And it seems to be what's trying to prevail in our country today. You know, they, they think if you cry the loudest, you'll get your way. It worked with Pilate. You know, verse uh, 4 and 5 also seem to be a fulfillment of Psalms 22, 6. Really, he was seen as less than a man in those verses. And that's how the Jews treated him, as less than a man. But once again, Pilate says, he tries to pass the buck, if you will. He says, well, you take him and crucify him. I can't find anything wrong with him. But the Jews answered in verse 7 and said, 
We have a law, and by our law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the son of God. Now, certainly if he was not the son of God, he would be guilty of blasphemy, and he ought to die. But yet he was the son of God. Uh, Gill writes that the Jews had a saying about God, and it goes like this. There is one, this is the holy, blessed God, not a second, for he hath no partner or equal in this world, yea, he hath neither child nor brother. He hath nor, no brother, nor hath he a son, but the holy, blessed God loves Israel and calls them his children and his brethren. Right. And certainly we are, that are born again, his children and really the brethren to Christ. But yet he had a son, Amen. and his name was Jesus. Amen. I don't know who the Jews thought was walking around in Daniel 3 in the fiery furnace it was the three Hebrews and one more likened unto the son of God but oh Christ God certainly he had a son and it was the person of Jesus they just didn't like that it was Jesus (laughs) they wanted one that would come down and take Israel back if you will and rule and reign from the throne and one day he'll do that I think but that was not his purpose at this time he said the real issue here was that they didn't want Jesus to be the son of God let's go on to verse 8 it says when Pilate therefore heard that saying he was the more afraid I'm not sure. it says he was more afraid I think because he knew that he wasn't going to be able to prevail that he was like I said, he was always trying to find the easy way out, and there was no easy way out here. I'm not... If the decision was left to the pilot, it didn't seem that he would have crucified Christ, but he feared the people more than he feared God. Right. So therefore, he delivered them to be crucified. Verse 9 says, And went again to the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave no answer. From where did you come from? He basically says. Pilate, being a Roman, uh, maybe he thought not that Jesus was a son of God, but he was a son of the gods. A big difference there. You know, they believed in multiple gods, and their gods were as men. You know, he wants to know where did Christ come from. Really, he came from God Jehovah, though. Certainly, he was born unto Mary in the house of Joseph but that was not who he was First, at the end there it says Jesus gave him no answer he just was silent once again as we see over and over throughout his trials and arrest that he was as a lamb that is dumb that is led to the slaughter verse 10 says then said Pilate unto him speakest thou not unto me knowest not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Pilate was kind of throw his weight around here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can crucify you or I can release you. I got this power, or so he thought. Verse 11, those, Jesus corrects them here. So Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. All power ultimately comes from God. Uh, Romans 13, 1 says, There is no power but of God. Was, we ought not to give too much power unto Satan, uh, to ascribe to him too much power, that is, for he is under the control of God just the same. We need look no further than the book of Job to see that. Amen. But Pilate, he had no power except what was given to him by God. You know, Donald Trump has no more power than what is given to him by God. Right. Pharaoh had no more power than what was given to him by than that by God. And so it is throughout all the kingdoms and governments of this world. Like I said, even in the spiritual realm, Satan himself only has as much power as God, for lack of a better way of putting it, allows him to have. Amen. Christ could have, once again... Just spoke a word and Pilate would have been out of here. 
Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. So Pilate was far from innocence, but the Jews, and even more so Judas, were even more guilty. You know, Judas becomes overwhelmed, if you will, with the guilt of what he had done. Not that he was, not that it was a godly sorrow, I don't think, but, and he ended up killing himself. Satan will leave you empty when he's done with you. But the Jews, they had the greater sin. They were the ones who wanted him dead. The very one who had power above all power. Yet they thought they could kill him. And I mean, in a sense they did, but they delivered him up to be killed, but yet he gave up the ghost himself. Verse uh, 12 says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever makest himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You know, perhaps Pilate was a little bit fearful of the, what Christ had said. He, he said he sought to release him. But it said the Jews, they were persistent. They kept crying out against Christ. It says here, they cried out and said, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever makest himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Almost if they were appealing here to the Roman law that there should be no king but Caesar. But yet even Caesar himself only had power as much as God had given him. You know, I think if Pilate had tried to release Christ, like if he had actually released him, they would have just took it up higher. And the Jews were full bent on having Christ killed. Verse 13 says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat him down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now here, I think is he brings him out of the judgment hall to where the Jews were. This is said to be the place where the Sanhedrin would have been located. And it was paved with stones, That's, thus it was called the pavement. I'll continue on in the next verse here. It says, And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold, your king. Some debate here what this is meant by the preparation of the Passover. Since Christ himself had ate the Passover the night before, we won't have enough time to get into all that debate, but... Whatever preparation it was, they were in a hurry to get Christ killed. And here's a point I want to talk about for just a minute, though. And it says, about the sixth hour. And this is, a, to many, a contradiction among the Gospels. If you recall from the other Gospels, Mark especially, says, and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. kind of hard to be crucified the third hour if he's still here in Pilate's hall the sixth hour. And when Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that there was darkness upon the earth from the sixth hour, at least about from the sixth hour to the or ninth hour. So for... You know, but according to Mark, he was crucified the ninth hour. There's several theories. One that John contains a manuscript error. I don't buy that that it should that it really should say the third hour here. Another theory is that Mark, when he said and they crucified him, this was a, a general statement that included other events. I don't quite think that's a good explanation either. So yet another theory is that the times here are relevant. You know, and in a sense the times were relevant. They didn't have you know precise watches like we did. But it still doesn't seem to really clarify about the sixth hour he was before Pilate and in the third hour he was crucified you know the Jews they reckon time the third hour the sixth hour the ninth hour you know, and then usually at the twelfth hour was sunset also it was the evening and the morning for the day for the Romans as much like our clock was from midnight to midnight and my thinking on this you may disagree with me and I may be wrong that uh, John was referencing a Roman time. This would 
align better with the other gospels because the sixth hour would have been six o'clock in the morning, which is when we find the other gospels mention him being tried in the morning. And uh, John also references other Roman times in his gospel. John one thirty nine mentioned the tenth hour, which the Jews didn't use, and four chapter four verse fifty two uses the seventh hour. So it seems that for whatever purpose John referenced Roman time versus Jewish time. Uh, I kind of think the Jewish time makes more sense personally, but <laughs> I don't know, for whatever reason we start our day in the middle of the night. So if it was the sixth hour, according to the Romans, it would have been six o'clock in the morning and he would have been before Pilate. And by the ninth hour, by the or excuse me, by the third hour, which was nine o'clock, he would have been crucified. But he says here in this particular passage, "Behold your king." Uh, perhaps he was one last attempt here to convey to the Jews to spare Jesus. I don't know, but "Behold your king" it was a true statement, at least. Verse fifteen says, "But they cried out." Away with him, away with him, crucify him. So again, no amount of pleading with the flesh will ever per persuade the flesh, if you will. You know, that's the problem with many of these false teachings today, which is another topic, but we can't appeal to the flesh and expect spiritual things to come forth. They cried out to crucify him, and it says, Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So here was another problem. The Jews were not going to see Christ as their king. They were perfectly happy, it seems like, with Caesar being their king. And for anyone who's interested in history, this was Caesar or Tiberius, I think is how it said. <laughs> Not the same Caesar that gave the taxing, but he has been ruling since early on in Christ's life. Verse 16 says, Then delivered he, speaking of Pilate, him, speaking of Christ, therefore unto them, the Jews, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two other with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. So here we see him led away and crucified between the two thieves. And Christ was in the midst. He was right there in the middle. That even in death he might have the preeminence. Verse 19 says, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This was the superscription as it's called in other Gospels. It almost seems that here is that he wrote it on something and then attached it to the cross. He wrote a title and put it on the cross. Verse 20 says, This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So that all that were passing by may see and may be able to read. Say, there were Greeks there, and many of the Jews spoke Greek. Well, obviously, Hebrew was the language of the Jews, and the Latin was the language of the Romans. Verse twenty-one says, "Then said Jesus, or then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews,' but he said, 'I am the King of the Jews.' So they didn't want this proclamation that he was King of the Jews. They wanted it to say that well, that's what he said." I mean, he did say he was king of the Jews, but he was king of the Jews. So, you know, the other gospels record that it said, "This is Jesus, the king of the Jews," or "This is the king of the Jews," or just simply the king of the Jews. So, perhaps each one seeing a piece of it, the whole might be, "This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews." Either which way, all are true; all were testified to who he was. 
Verse 22 says, Pilate answered, what, have I, what I have written, I have written. So he was unwilling to change it. Verse 23 says, Then the soldiers, with, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among them, seeing that this was a, a nice coat, if you will, that it was woven, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lot, or they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. So here, the the parting of the garment and the casting upon his coat was a fulfillment of Psalms twenty-two, eighteen. I don't think the soldiers knew what they were doing, but yet they were fulfilling the scriptures in it. And God over and over again fulfills his purpose by even wicked men. Even those that don't realize they're fulfilling his purpose, they fulfill it. And I also thought it interesting here that he was wearing a woven garment because according to Exodus 28, 32, that was how the high priest garment was to be made. Their robe was to be a woven one that that wouldn't tear. And just the same here, Christ was wearing this woven coat. Just once again to show that he was our great high priest. Let's go on to verse 25 here. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Well, here we only find the women. Some suppose that his mother's sister and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, are some, the same. Some say that they're a different person. I'm not quite sure. I didn't try to figure out who she was. But nevertheless, we know that these Marys were here. And yet, where were his disciples? When John was close by, as we see in verse 26, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. So John was here, I believe it was John at least. And even in dying such a horrific death, he takes care of his mother. So once again, being the great example for us, that we are to take care of our parents, and probably in particular our mothers. He can commend her unto John for her care. I don't know if Joseph has passed away or if he would shortly later. He had other brethren, but he was the the firstborn, so it was really his responsibility. Verse 27 says, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the dis that disciple took her unto his own. So John took her and took care of her just as if he was, or she was his own mother. Verse 28 says, And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. It's almost, if you will, a hard thought to think that the one who created all the water in the world and all the universe and could easily speak more into existence would cry out, I thirst. Obviously, this fulfills again Psalms 22 15, as well as Psalms 69 21. You know, he said in Psalms 22 that his tongue cleave it to his jaws. He was dried up like a pot shirt. Christ at this point had been physically all used up. He was about to give up the ghost. Verse 29 says, though that now there was a set, or there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Uh, it seems that this was the same vinegar as before, but perhaps without the murder this time. Mm -hmm. And they bring it and they you know, put it upon a, a stick on a sponge and stick it up there to him. And this time he drinks of it. Except perhaps because he didn't have the murder in it this time. 
but I can't imagine being so dried up and so thirsty and yet here's vinegar to drink I've said over and over again I, I don't desire the taste of vinegar especially not just a straight shot of it yet in his great thirst that's what they give our Lord and Savior Verse 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You know, it is finished. There's a lot that could be said there. Amen. I think the sacrifice had been completed. Right. You know, our sin had been paid for. Yeah. Uh, we had been reconciled to God. Yeah. Below or over. He had defeated the devil, according to Hebrews. Now, certainly, even more so, we gain from his resurrection. You know, he didn't just stay in the grave, even though that that would have paid for sin, but that wouldn't have brought us everything else that we needed. But he bowed up. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He once again, as we see, willingly gave up his life. Not that any would take it from him, but voluntarily he would lay down his life for us. Let's. Go ahead and continue on here. We'll hurry up through the rest of the chapter. The Jews therefore said, or the Jews therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. Some debate on what exactly the Sabbath day was. It does seem to be a, a special Sabbath day, as it was called a high Sabbath. But it was a violation of Jewish law that they would remain there overnight. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 through 23 tells us this. That's also where it says, Cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. Uh, it says, They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away, you know, as if to hasten their death. You know, the crucifixion didn't kill you by losing all your blood, at least not normally. It was usually by asphyxiation. You know, crucifixion is still legal in Islamic places. I think in Iran, though, if you can survive three days, they'll let you go. I can't imagine hanging on the cross for three days. I don't know that I'd want to be living after that. But you know, the whole weight of your body pulling down upon you and really cutting off your air supply, it said that you they would push up with their legs and that's why they break their legs so they couldn't anymore and they would just go ahead and asphyxiate. Verse 32 says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. Oh, here we have the breaking of the legs of the thieves. Verse 33 says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. There was really no need to. He was dead already. You know, I... I think, and I, th I think I learned this from Adam. That, or first got the first thought from Adam was that Christ died from bleeding out, not from asphyxiation. He had bled tremendously at this point. Verse 34 says, "But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water." Well, here was the atoning blood for our sins. Some suppose that he was stabbed through the heart. Maybe uh, our nurses here could talk more on that. <laughs> yeah, it was up through the side, and out came the water and the blood, it says. Verse 35, John adds a little note here, and he says, And he said, or he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith, he knoweth that he saith true that you might believe. You know, John adds, I mean, this I saw and yes, it was true. Verse 36 and 37 say, For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. You know, Psalm 34 20 tells us that his bones would not be broken. I think it's referring to Zechariah 12.10 where it says that they would look upon me whom they have pierced. Christ was speaking in the first person there. 
or God was. Okay, and the remaining of the chapter here is the burial of Christ. It says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews. Secret disciples is another sermon topic, but we won't get on then. Besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And here, verse 9, John gives us another detail that's not recorded in the other Gospels. And it says, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So this was no small mm-hmm. amount of spices that he brought. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound him in linen cloth with the spices as a manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never a man yet laid. Now this belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, the other Gospels tell us. It was a rich man's tomb. But here, John tells us it was in a garden next to Calvary. And verse 42 says, There laid... They, Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So they, they basically tossed him over in the closest grave they could get to. And lest we think that he stayed there, he rose again three days later. You know, I don't know if these tombs are still present over in Israel or not. I imagine they've been wiped out throughout the ages, but the tomb would still be empty today if it was still there. I would like to look at two verses real quick in First John, and we'll close. First uh, John four ten. First John four ten says, "Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins." Uh, here was my homework assignment. To, did you know what propitiation means? Go ahead, brother. It's really a, an appeasing, if you will. Webster's, or do you have anything to add, brother? I want to give you a chance if you had something. Webster's describes it, or defines it as the act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor of an offended person, which in our case would be God. Mm-hmm. You know, I often define it as that Christ was the eternally satisfying sacrifice for our sins. You know, uh, Isaiah says that. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He was satisfied with Christ's sacrifice for our sins. We'll see this. We might see this word propitiation again next week. Uh, Paul does use it in Romans. It's also used in the more "quote unquote" controversial verse in First John two. That he's propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let's look back, though, at chapter 1, verse 7 of 1 John. It says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin, not our own doings. And he cleanses us from all sin, he says. Not just some of them. That's a blessed thought in itself, that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. You know, it's not good works, it's not baptism, it's not church membership, it's not your lineage, it's not your office in the church or your position in society. It's not any of these things, but simply the blood of Christ. The priest can't do it, the pope can do it, the pastor can do it. Well, with the blood of Christ, he cleanses us from all sin. What a blessed thought that all our sin has been cleansed in Christ. I guess we'll uh, close up with that thought. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the sacrifice of Christ in the epistles of Peter and Paul, which will be a, quite a task. We'll try to hit the high points at least. It says that he would yeah, he was numbered among the transgressors which was fulfilled in being 
crucified between two thieves. He was. He was. Uh, I think it says he made his. Let's turn. We'll turn over there. So I can't quote exactly. Isaiah fifty-three, though. Isaiah 53, 12 is where it says he was numbered with the transgressors. And um, Verse 9, of that says he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. So he was buried among wicked men and rich men is that, which was, we know Joseph was a rich man and he was buried in Joseph's tomb. <laughs> okay, my homework assignment I'm assigned tonight is I mentioned that we are reconciled to God by the death of Christ. Uh, Romans 5.10 tells us that. For lack of a better word, what responsibility are we given as a result of that reconciliation? Uh, you can find that in one of the Corinthian letters. <laughs> what, what's the question? What quote-unquote responsibility do we have as a result of being reconciled to God? I could use another word, but I pretty much give the answer away. Then, yeah. <laughs> Brother Kenny might know it. Uh, I just, if you'll hear, I'd like yeah, to go ahead. Things. First of all, the garment is very specific um, because it's just it's one piece, like yeah. um, Rabbi Del put on the sweater, but it was cut from a number of pieces of cloth and then sewn together. A true woven garment doesn't have any sin. Yeah, that was the point of the. That was the point of the high priest having woven garments so it couldn't get yeah, torn. Exactly. And uh, there was another thing I wanted to get. Uh, oh, concerning crucifixion. And like you said, your death is by asphyxiation. But when someone's dying, their lungs start to fill with anybody. And that's the whole sin of death. When someone is dying, they often lift their head up real high so they can breathe with what they have left. And that's good for what it does is put the fluids in the air. So to fulfill that all blood came out, the Lord used it as stabbing, and then what had collected the earth came out. Apparently I'm sure he was drained dry, but not a drop of it was wasted. Right. Exactly. Well, and that's my point. It all it had to be everything. And so I think that's why the Lord led the, the soldier to do it. In the sacrifices, they had to use all the blood. Exactly. So if that was pocketed in there, it had to get out. All right. You said something here about the leaving them in the that The Romans usually left them there to be ate up by the birds and everything else. Probably one of the reasons why it was called the place of the skull. I'm sure there were skulls laying all around if that was a place of crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing else will be dismissed.